to the Beach Historical Society. We're very happy you're here, and we have a, a quite a program coming. I want to make a few announcements. First, though, my name's Ed Stork. I'm president-elect of the Historical Society. And if you're not a member yet of the Historical Society, we'll hope you'll join. Everything in the Historical Society is done with membership dues and donations. And matter of fact, Johanna's back there, and she can even take credit cards for memberships. And they don't have to have cash or check. Yeah, credit card will do. We'd love to have some more members. We also are always looking for volunteers. I, I, as most of you know, I think our headquarters is at the Murphy Smith Bungalow between Wells Fargo Bank and Whole Foods. And I'm always looking for volunteer docents. It seems like sometimes <laughs> we always have some openings. So if anybody's interested, I'd be happy if you see me tonight before it's over or anybody else with one of these names on on the board of the directors. A uh, couple other things. Uh, some of you may have driven by the bungalow recently, and you notice we're finally having the front porch fixed after the automobile accident that happened a long time ago. Uh, Greg Abel and his crew are out there, and it, lo it looks pretty good. They're not done yet, but <laughs> it's getting close, and we're ha real happy about that. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to uh, announce for those of you that don't know that uh, we had a $5,000 donation that, that Sandy uh, Desmond arranged toward the bungalow from uh, Dave Walker, whose fund is the Laguna Beach Community Foundation. And we are members of that. The Historical Society is members of that. Uh, Mr. Dan Pin <laughs> Mr. Dan Pingaro from the uh, foundation was instrumental in, and instrumental in raising the do donation, and he was the one who came to our meeting and explained the foundation to us. And we're participating in that now to try to help with the, with the finances. It's always a struggle when you're all volunteers. We're very glad you're here tonight, though. In fact, we've had several donations. We appreciate everyone that comes in, and, and they're put to good use. We have no administrative costs because we have no employees. <laughs> so it doesn't, all, we, all we use our money on is, is for keeping the bungalow up to date and keeping the materials up to date and uh, trying to keep the history of Laguna Beach alive and well. Tonight, our speaker is Carol Vebeck Lloyd. She's a distinguished member of the Laguna Beach Historical Society Board of Directors. She was born in Whittier, California, and she grew up in Santa Ana, where her parents owned a successful bakery called Vebeck's Bakery. As a young girl, she was involved in competitive swimming and reached the national level along with qualifying for the Olympic trials. But I won't tell you what year. <laughs> After high school, she went into uh, getting her master's degree in education and reading from John Hopkins University. And she taught for quite a while. And she now has opened a reading center in Corona Del Mar called Success Team Learning, serving students for in and around Corona Del Mar. She'll be traveling to Malawi, Africa in August to help support the needs of a preschool and elementary school age children in their language and reading acquisition. In her personal life, she has two children and six grandchildren. <laughs> She'll be sharing about her early pioneering family who came to Laguna Beach in the 1870s. And she'll be telling about her mother's primary research and development of Laguna Beach's homestead map. And by the way, the homestead maps, she has some of them here. They will be for sale afterwards, and part of the proceeds for that go to the Historical Society. They're $40 each, the maps. Uh, and she'll tell us what, a lot about downtown. One of the interesting things, if you don't know it already, that her family at one time had a house right here. <laughs> and before the city hall and other things came along, they had their home here. So without any further ado, I introduce to you Carol Vivek Lloyd. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. I, I really am more comfortable facing you guys than with my side to you, but I want to also uh, match what I'm doing with you to the screen up there. So thank you for coming. I just love seeing some of my, my friends, and uh, it's always fun to see people out of context of what we're doing right now, and you see these people out of other, other parts of your life, and you're going, oh, yeah. You know, I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but thank you, Ed, for that introduction, and thank you, friends and Historical Society and others for being here. 
I presented here two years ago on somewhat of the same subject, but tonight I'm extending it. Uh, I'm going to cover some of the things that I shared with last time. Uh, I just feel that that foundation is important for you to and myself to make sure that we know what, what were the original people and efforts and adventures like for them. Um, as, as Ed mentioned, <clears throat> the proceeds from the map that my mother printed out uh, and selling it tonight, if you're interested, I'm going to have two of my good historical society friends up here helping. But in August, end of August, part of that uh, money will go toward a group of grandmothers in Malawi, Africa, who are serving their, children, their grandchildren's needs by being their caretakers because they're, most of the parents have died of AIDS. So we're excited about Sherry Yamamoto. Stand up, Sherry. Come on. She and I are going to Malawi. So we're excited about that. And uh, so that's what I want to donate the funds toward that and also toward the Historical Society. <clears throat> so I'm going to kind of keep to my notes this time more than I did last time because I have some additional uh, parts that I didn't share, but, but I need to kind of make sure I'm on the right track, in other words. So um, I, I don't want to start off anything until I really share about my mother and her wonderful efforts that she went through. And a number of you knew her. She passed away about a half a year ago from Alzheimer's at 93. And she was a brilliant, bright, strong woman. And, um, and it was a pleasure and an honor to be her daughter. I miss her and my dad, but... <laughs> I did this last time. <laughs> but she did share with me that she wants me to carry on sharing about her work and what our family did in Laguna. So this is for her. <laughs> if any of you have mothers that you don't have anymore, <laughs> many of us, <laughs> many of us, mostly when they're bright and strong and vibrant and all that, then it's, it's a loss for sure, and even if not. Anyway, so I'm going to be talking about early homesteading and the development of downtown Laguna. But I also want to then uh, include Henry Rogers and his son, George Rogers, who subdivided downtown Laguna. So this is going to be a fairly three-part talk tonight, and I hope I can get in all in in an hour. Okay, let's see. That might be the goal I have for myself. Uh, I am here to represent also our family who are, were pioneers like your families were and are pioneers that we will never understand the challenges that they had to go through. Our challenges are first world country challenges. What am I going to have for lunch at Wahoo's? <laughs> What's new on the earth menu? <laughs> oh my goodness, fighting off bobcats and the squirrels that get in th into the corn husks uh, wagons. This is what they had to deal with. It. No, it wasn't third world. It was a totally different world even from that. So. My mother, um, and I'll go on from here, uh, she grew up in Orange County, and uh, she heard growing up for many, many years from her family members about our family in Laguna Beach. She had many cousins down here, and her aunts and uncles, and her grandmother, and her great-grandmother, <gasps> and, and yet, with that, though, she had further questions that she wanted to have answered. So I'm going to kind of forefront for you on that and that I want to talk to you about that. But I know she's now up in heaven with my dad. My dad passed away about four years ago, and he, George Feedback, was an amazing man. Um, he and my mother worked very hard to, to work uh, a wonderful bakery that was very successful in Orange County, and they worked tremendously hard to maintain that. But they're now dancing the Balboa. If any of you know of that, they did, up in heaven with those big band orchestras. I just know they're doing that. Aren't they cute? Aren't they cute? My dad was in the Navy, and uh, so, so cute. So the beginnings of her arduous search were amazing. 
And as I said, she had heard many stories from her family about beginning, beginnings of Laguna. But she also, and I'm going to read, I found her, and I have so much of her stuff now. Uh, her original homestead map is sitting on the easel over there. And I'll talk about that creation of that as time goes. But I found her little note card, so I feel kind of close to her reading this. It doesn't have her blood drops, though, from working so hard, but it's okay. And then she says, it was strictly by accident that uh, she, and I can read this from, from this, too. These stories came from her family, and yet in the 1990s, she said that she reread a speech that her grandmother, Jenny Wayman Johnson, had given around 1933 to the Laguna Beach Women's Club. And she found that in that, that original uh, speech that my great-grandmother and her grandmother, Jenny Johnson, gave. And her sister, Ora Warling, were charter members of the Laguna Beach Women's Club. But she was determined to find out more. So she ended up, after a lot of search, ended up going up to Sacramento to the Department of Interior. And in that department, she had no idea who were these people in our family that owned government land. She had no idea about that. So what she ended up doing was, with my dad, she, they drove up there in the 1990s, and she started talking and asking them, and she found microfiche, which no longer is what we do. And she, with my dad, started turning those microfiche wheels and found that document on it. And that document is... My great, great, he's first generation. I'm sixth generation. My mother was fifth generation Laguna Beach. That's first generation homestead title that he got, signed by Rutherford B. Hayes, in 18, 1873, I believe. So when my mother found that, it was like she struck gold. She struck the gold. The gold rush people didn't. She struck the gold. This was Amazing. I wish I would have been in person, but she called me when she found that, and this lady was like dancing on the phone with me. She said, Carol, Carol, you won't believe what I just found. I knew our family had government land, but I didn't know they had homesteads in Laguna. So on from that, she then, and this is her notebook that I have, she then, <laughs> this is what she's all about, she typed out, Oh, it's okay. No, I don't want to do the handheld. Okay. I used to see throughout the country on this The more and more I find myself, I'm going to go through. I am one of those. So, this isn't working. So, she, I'll keep loudly. It has to be on the TV. It won't be on the TV. It's okay. I don't know. So she, she typed these out. Hello? <laughs> I won't be recorded unless I'm on here. Okay. She typed all of these out, and then she went ahead with my dad and Xeroxed off every title off the microfiche, every homestead title off the microfiche. This is some kind of woman. <laughs> and this is primary research. This is primary research. She did not read it in a book. She did not get it any other place, of course, not on Google at that time, but she, she copied off every one, and she put them in this book. So there's 39 here, one woman, all men, other than Lulu Goff, and she uh, went ahead then, and, and this is a copy of uh, exactly what I showed you, the list, and from there... She went on to put all of those markings that she read on every title onto her map. And she bought that map from the city for $2. And it was just a basic street map. But what she did was, and I remember going over to her house and seeing that map on her dining room table with her markers and her yardstick <laughs> belaboring over that map. And that's why she's so protective 
of that map. She had it copyrighted, and she was so protective of that map because she worked primary research, putting all the, the um, whatever you call the borders, et cetera, on there. And then she also, and I have my little pointer, she also had wonderful handwriting, and she listed out all those homestead people on either side and had it and, and put little side notes about it. Now this, I can talk about that map specifically. Some of you have already come up to see it, but over here to the left of the canyon of Broadway, Irvine Ranch owned all this. So what she found was that George, I mean, Abraham Lincoln started the Homestead Act, and he did that in order to have Western expansion. And it was right after the Civil War, and the uh, country needed that new thrust, that new life. So that's what he put together. But to have a homestead, you had to be 21 years old. You had to be the head of the family. You were given most of it 160 acres of land. And you had to prove it up in five years. Otherwise, you could buy each acre, I believe it was $5 an acre, if you didn't prove up. And uh, they encouraged, so this encouraged westward expansion. And um, you can't see that, but uh, it lists all the important dates that took place during this time, such as the Civil War. Slavery was ab abolished. Lincoln was assassinated at the top. Um, and that's when Henry Rogers was involved in getting his homestead. So it, it kind of has a real important time period for history of what happened in Laguna Beach. So all of you that are here are a part of that history, right? Even today, two minutes ago, you're a part of the history of Laguna Beach. And my mom said that she created this map as a remembrance and homage to those 39 homesteaders and those who have gone before us, and to share my drawing and hand lettering for us who love Laguna Beach. And that's her quote that she expressed on different types of flyers and things like that. So on her map, and you won't, well, maybe some of you on the side can see it, but she goes on to list the first homesteader uh, in the central Laguna Beach area was George Fountain, and then the second one was uh, James Sterling, John Damron, and then down at fifth is Henry Rogers. And his homestead was signed by Rutherford B. Hayes, as I mentioned. And they all had to be signed by a president. They all had to be signed by a president. And, uh, one of, and Harvey Hemingway is in there at 1895. Lulu Goff is in there. So you're going to, if you look at that, uh, William Brooks is in there. You're going to recognize those names, a lot of those names. Joe Prisk was a cousin of Henry Rogers. And he received his homestead because he fought in the Civil War. So it kind of was based on not just fighting in the Civil War. It was based on representing the Union at that time. You had to be a supporter of the Union in order to be honored and given that signature by a president. So that's what took place there. So that first generation, Generation 1, is, um, is Henry Rogers. And this is a lineage of what I put together uh, because my dear friend Jane Jantz, and she's like my, my sister, she is such a wonderful historian. She's back there. Does everybody know Jane Jantz? Jane, are you hiding? She's hiding. Okay, you can hide. Not for long, but you can hide. <laughs> yes, she is amazing. And her heart is so much into history. She knew my mother, and she... First time I had lunch with her, I said, you're just kind of like my sister. If you knew my mom and my dad, then you're OK. You know. So anyway, Henry Rogers, and then he had a son, George, which he subdivided downtown. And George had a sister, Marianne Rogers. That's my lineage, the maternal lineage of my family. So Marianne Rogers, whose father was Henry and Elizabeth Wilkinson Rogers, she had my great grandmother, Jenny Wayman Brino Johnson. And Jenny was a sister of Ora Wayman, who I'll be talking about later. And then my grandmother, Lenore, Brino Wilson, and then my mother, and then myself. So there's six generations, and, and I was going to say, because of Jane, I put it in that order versus 
years, which is really challenging for anybody to, to come together with on that. So uh, let me catch up to where I am. Okay. So getting on to Henry, he was born in Cornwall, England, and at 17 years old, he came over with his mom and dad to Illinois, Galena, Illinois specifically, of which Ed knows about, right? Ed, yes, near Chicago. And it's on the Mississippi River. And they farmed, and he was with other members of his family. But when it went dormant, they, the men worked in the lead mines. And that's an, a telling point because health caused that problem and working with the lead mines, which brought many of them out here, but the wet air then also caused them to have to go back. So an interesting mix of, of physical Ill, illness and conditions. So um, well, even though he, I mean, he married Elizabeth Jane Wilkinson, and they had four children, George being one of them, Marianne, my great-great-grandmother, and two of the children who died at a young age. And I believe, and our family does believe, and my mother did kind of share a lot with me, but he, he, Henry, was concerned about the family's health and his own health. And that's why he decided to venture forth at 51 years old. It's never too late, men. It's never too late, women. And um, this is the town of Galena at that time. Charming, wonderful town. And I'm doing this to show a little contrast. Uh, but the lead mines were tough to work in, and he had seen, as many had, the promotion that said California for better health and better climate, and that drew him a lot for that reason. And having two children that possibly died, you, we don't know if that was also a stimulus for, for choosing to go that route. So he went... He, and we believe he went with his brother, we're not sure, but he traveled down the Mississippi River to New Orleans on a paddle wheel boat, and then he took the ship, the steamship, around the Cape Horn and up to San Francisco. He came to Orange County in 1873, right after that. He stayed with John and, and Thomas Edwards, who are, are the family connected with the Edwards Theater. They had come an, a year earlier than Henry. They came from Galena, Illinois also. So they, at least he had a place to stay. You know, wouldn't that be an incredible, strange thing otherwise if he didn't? So that's one of the pictures of a steamship around Cape Corn. But then he was so excited, he wrote Dear Elizabeth, 44 years old, sell everything, gather as many family and friends who want to come and come. Henry. And they sent that through, not Pony Express, that had already banned it at that time. It was through Western, I believe, Western Union. But he, she got the message. She got the message. So she was a brave woman at 44 years old. And that's her, or that is she. And she had a two-story home. She sold her two-story home. And she would often share to others around her that she had hardwood floors that she would use charcoal to buff and shine, and they shined and gleaned beautifully. Another hint about what she moved to. So she encouraged and actually, and that's something uh, that her home might have looked like. They had a farm with their home also. She encouraged a train trip of 22 family and friend uh, travelers with her. Right after that, they sold everything, including their homes, and came out. And these are a list of the members that traveled on that train. Only to point out that George Rogers was on his honeymoon with his wife, Lottie. Marianne, my great-great-grandmother, she was there. but uh, And Henry Wayman, her husband. And then it goes down to Jenny Wayman, my great-grandmother, was two years old. And... She, this doesn't shine on the, the red doesn't shine on that screen. And then uh, her sister, Aura Warling, was four years old. And then the, some of the Edwards family was there. Joe Priss, cousin of my 
um, great 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 grandfather was there, and their wife, his wife, and then three children, and Joe Caldwell and Jim Bennett. So that was 22 total, and um, they ventured out. So what happened was that they traveled on the Transcontinental Railroad, which in 1869 had driven that last spike at Promontory Point in Utah. And but by now they they went on that. They bought. Uh, Elizabeth bought, and they called her Lizzie. She bought uh, an economy ticket. So their trip lasted for three and a half weeks. Versus real quick, where you don't stop at every depot along the way, and you can get to San Francisco in probably two weeks. But anyway, she rented two boxcars. One boxcar they filled with their animals, and they had, they had cattle, horses, and smaller animals in one boxcar, and then all of them slept in the other boxcar. With, uh, they had straw and goose down feather beds on top of that. So they loaded barrels of apples and sauerkraut, ham and piccadilly, which is a relish, and they spent three and a half weeks on that trip. So I would have loved to have been there. <laughs> but what on the way there, my, my great-grandmother, Jenny Johnson, who was only two years old, they couldn't find her. And the Indians, the strife of the Indians at that time had settled down a little bit. But they thought maybe the Indians took her at two years old. And I wouldn't be here if that were the case. So you know the end of the story, right? You know the end of the story. Anyway, they did find her crawling, they found her curled up in one of the boxcars sleeping. So that was, uh, that, well, that would be frightening. Indians taking your children, taking your little children. This is the trip that they traveled on, on the Transcontinental Railroad. And that's basically when they arrived, they came down to Westminster, San Pedro, really, on a ship from San Francisco, and Henry and the Edwards family picked them up in a horse and wagon, and they stayed with the Edwards family in Westminster for about a year. And then in 1879, Henry went on to acquire, as I discussed earlier, the fifth homestead of Laguna of 160 acres from Temple Hills to the Mesa at Bluebird Canyon. And he went on to build a two-story house on his land to prove up. Frank Goff lived in that house for the time being, until Henry moved that house down to right here, down 3rd Avenue, we believe it was down 3rd Avenue, on skids on the front of the house and skids on the back. He couldn't have gotten it down any other way, we don't feel, unless he wanted to come down a little more steep hill behind us. So, but um, uh, Frank Goff lived there, and Frank Goff handled beehives at that time also. So beehives were proving up, planting eucalyptus trees was proving up, and building a structure could prove up. So that was the intention, and that's what Henry went ahead and did. And again, that's the rundown. So now we're going to move on to George Rogers and his sister Mary Ann Rogers, my great, great. I have to kind of remind everybody about that because I would get confused after a while. <coughs> but just to talk about Mary... <coughs> She kind of looks like my great-grandmother, Jenny Johnson, a little bit. Um, she married um, Henry Wayman, and they had three small children, but he died at 36 as a result of injuries that he acquired in the Civil War. He fought in the Civil War. So Mary had three children to raise by herself, Jenny Johnson, Ora Warling, and Frank Wayman. And then Mary, Mary married George Rolfe. So that's why she has Rolf at the end of her name. So this is George Rogers, Generation 2. And his wife was Charlotte Lottie Clapper Rogers. She was a Clapper, if any of you have heard of that old family name. Everybody called her Lottie. That's her oldest daughter, Elizabeth. And, and she came, as I pointed out to you, on the train from Galena, Illinois. They were on their honeymoon at that time. So George went ahead, and he lived in Anaheim for six years. His father lived here, but he lived in Anaheim for six years, 
And yet in 1881, he bought 155 and a half acres from the Rawson brothers, who previously bought their homestead from downtown Laguna, and I'll share with you where that lies, from John Damron. And I pointed out John Damron on the map because he, he had the original homestead. So the Rawson brothers were quickly trying to acquire a lot of property, and um, they got in over their heads, and so my, my great-great-uncle, George, bought it for $1,000 gold for the 155 and a half acres. George's homestead went from, from Canyon Acres Road down to uh, 3rd Street, up Mystic Hills, which is right behind us, to Park Drive, and then out to the ocean, and then up PCH until Broadway, and then it went back out to the canyon. So that's where his original flatland purchase of the flatland also came. And this, uh, this on Broadway, is it the SLU, Jane? SLU, is that pronounced SLU? Thank you. That was, that was on Broadway at that time, and I love that picture that is by Joseph Kleitsch. I just love that. But uh, that isn't even close to what it looked like at the beginnings, of course, but I'm not sure what time period that truthfully was. But that's kind of up. Do you know? The painting is 19, uh, was painted between 1925 and 1926. Okay. Uh, So he went on to, Henry, I mean uh, George, he went on to build his ranch house. They call it the ranch house right here where the pepper tree is. And uh, he built it out of wood that he received from uh, San Pedro area. They planted eucalyptus trees, he and his dad, Henry, thinking that that eucalyptus tree was going to be the miracle tree. But it twists when it grows, and it didn't work out. And they got it from Australia, and it, they were so, I'm sure, very excited about it. But they did plant a lot in the canyon. There are some still originals over at, um, uh, they planted in the sawdust also. So there are some, and of course, in the latest news, there are some even over at the uh, Lumber Yard Mall, right? So, or there's one there now, I think. I'm not sure if it's two or one. So this is a house that George built. And it, um, and and it it might not be exactly what it looked like, but this painting is right in the city hall offices, right in the lobby behind the right hand desk area, and you'll see it. And it's really a beautiful painting. It's really great. So George went on to build it, and it was batten board, and uh, his wife and four children stayed there. And his oldest daughter, Elizabeth, when she was six years old, Lizzie planted the pepper tree out in front. And that now is 135 years old. It is still going. They're doing a lot to, I think, save it and preserve it. And who knows how much longer. But it's been a treat to see it lit up for Christmas time. And my mother did have a ceremony of lighting it at one time. So when Henry brought down his two-story house that he had proved up up in Temple Hills, they attached it onto they attached it onto George's house and it gave at that time finally it gave a, made a larger kitchen and it added another little room and dining room and then the upstairs is where the, the children at least had their bedrooms. He also George built the first school on his property right here for his children, but any other children around. So he really did a lot to kind of uh, see his dreams of starting a small town come true. That was at the beginning. So that is uh, another picture of the house. I'm not sure who's in it, but I'm assuming it's family members. And that's their family uh, at that time. Maybe uh, there was eight at that time, and that, that definitely looks like eight to me. So he wanted a small town originally. That was his dream. And 
because he wanted to offer the people who camped on the main beach area in their tents, tent city, he wanted to offer them little cottages to stay in instead of just the tents. And he also wanted to provide uh, hardware and supplies for building because at that time you would only be able to drive to Tustin or Newport and, and get your supplies that way. And they weren't totally you know, equipped with supplies either. So his desire was really to start this effort to make that happen for everyone. And I love this little um, painting also. My mother's typing us up there, and it just kind of repeats what I've been sharing about. So George had hired Steel Finley, who was a very prominent uh, surveyor at that time, to start the subdivision possibilities of the flatland area of Laguna. And it was a, an expensive venture for him. Uh, we had heard that Henry even had to sell off some of his homestead to pay for that expensive venture to have that subdivided. So that was in 1887. And what Henry wanted was, I mean, what George wanted was to include Forest Avenue and Ocean Avenue and a few streets. And in that top left, if I had the pointer that worked up there, but I don't, that was the original subdivision in that it says B, and you can almost maybe see that up there. But um, that's forest, and then ocean right there, and then beach in the middle. And he then had Steel Finley start that. But he also wanted to add Mermaid, which is, of course, right up at that triangular area. And uh, so in 1888, those streets were added, all those other streets were added to that initial subdivision, and that's why it's called the Rogers Edition. So you will see that at times, possibly, in records and write-ups called the Rogers Edition. So after paying for this expensive subdivision process, uh, he could start seeing his dreams come true. And this total, the total lots that he had were 323 lots there. So he did have dreams. He really had dreams. He scraped the downtown streets with his horses and dragging the scraping behind, and he named Forest Avenue. They planted a lot of eucalyptus trees on forest, but he took a lot of them out to get those lots more accessible to people to purchase. And he also named Ocean because from his ranch house, he could see the ocean. So he called that, he named that street also. He then also paved, or didn't pave, he scraped the area right in front that parallels the ocean, which became the Coast Highway in 1926. So he, he dug all of that frontage out back there also. Now to go on and talk to you about the early development of downtown Laguna, because that's the add-on this time that I wanted to share. And, and I'm not going to talk about different properties, but I do want to say that I have some wonderful friends um, as you researchers and explorers and historians also do. Uh, and at the courthouse, they were kind enough to copy off all of Rogers Edition's transfers of title and to who they went to and what date and what time and what lot. And with my magnifying glass, <laughs> I might be able to pick out some of these people. So in my heart's desire to be ready for you today, I really kind of wanted to go through a lot of these and say that this lot right here, you know, this lot right here, wherever it is, this lot transferred over to so-and-so in 18, you know, 1888. And this lot right here transferred over to so-and-so. But boy, I'll tell you, this is, this is going to take somebody beyond myself, like my mother, to do this. My mother would attack this like crazy. But running the clinic as I do in Crone Del Mar and other things, this is not going to be my priority, but it might be in 10 years from now. So um, anyway, uh, so I want to talk about the third generation, my great-grandmother, Jenny Wayman Johnson and Ora Wayman Warling. They were, they were sisters, and they married brothers. My great-grandmother married uh, Ed Bruno, who was French, and Ora married his brother, John Bruno. And... John died, Jenny divorced Ed, for whatever reason, I don't know. But I love her anyway. I love her anyway. She, I knew her, uh, and, 
and I, I remember her often. You know, quite a wonderful lady. Now, this is Aura, her sister, with her husband, Oscar. Now, Aura and Oscar bought quite a bit of downtown subdivision property from, from George. And this is her husband, Oscar Warling. He was really highly regarded in Laguna at that time, as small a population as it was. But he really was the kind of person that would do anything for anyone. And uh, it shows in different circumstances, as I'll share a little bit with you. But he helped build the first pier down below Las Brisas by um, Irvine's request to do that. So he then acquired Nick Esch to help him with that. And I think it was $100 that, that James Irvine gave them. And they built that first pier. And eventually, I think, when did it go? 1939. Oh, look at you. 38. That was, there were a few of them. Good, good. We have some good historians. Let's have a meeting. Let's have a, let's have a support group. We need a support group. <laughs> okay, so this is what, now let me not get ahead of myself. Um, so after George subdivided downtown, Aura bought that ranch house in 1896 from him. And she lived there for 20 years with Oscar. And, and that's another picture of it, because I love that painting, too. And uh, Henry, during that time period, I mean, George, during that time period, had, had ill health. But I also hear stories that possibly he was discouraged that that subdivision that he worked so hard to get paid for and set up that people just weren't grabbing those lots like crazy. That's what I've heard. And to be honest with you, I don't know. But then he moved back and helped farm uh, in Kirksville, Missouri. He helped farm back there. But eventually they came back here. So anyway, in that time period, then Aura bought that, that ranch house from him and lived, it, lived there for 20 years. Now, that ranch house, the Warlings, Aura Warling and Oscar, they leased it eventually to the Women's Club right up here on St. Anne's. And the Women's Club had it, and they then bought it. But then the city of Laguna Beach wanted it as their city hall. So they took it by eminent domain. And they, though they paid $27,500, but the Women's Club said, please leave the pepper tree. So I have the Women's Club to thank for that. And, um, and all of us do, because that is a, it's a fun thing to think that that tree is that old. This is a painting of the ranch house, and it could have been when it turned into the look of a, of a woman's club. But that's just a summary of what I've been sharing about, but I wanted to add that in there. So now we're going to talk about another piece of property uh, on Forest. And this is called the Laguna Beach Laundry Develops into the Forest Avenue Mall. And I, uh, our family, now my, my extended family, still own the property at the Forest Mall. They don't own the building. But uh, that's, of course, what it looks like. It's not, um, it's not what it was, but it sure is a lot more than what it was. Let me tell you, so I want to share with you a little bit of the history on that. And... Aura Warling, who was my great-grandmother's sister, was a very sharp woman. And with her husband dying, he left her some money. So besides buying the ranch house from her, her uncle, she also uh, wanted to get a piece of property, and she bought that property there from her uncle George and built a laundry. And, or she had the property, I should say. I'm going to back up. Her daughter, Lola, uh, had lost her husband, Elmer Robbins. And Elmer was the, he started the first paper in Laguna Beach, Laguna Life. And Lola married him. And Laguna Life, uh, he went on from there then to, with being married to Lola, up to Hollywood. And he became uh, W. Griffith's uh, assistant and publisher and photographer because Elmer Robbins loved photography. He, he take, took a lot of shots in Laguna and he loved photography. He also uh, started the camera 
paper up in Hollywood. And it was the first uh, paper, and I just had that. Um, and this is, um, I, don't, I don't think it's the original, because the original of uh, the camera would be in disrepair at this time. But Elmer Robbins, Lola's husband, or his daughter, uh, <laughs> this is his paper that he put together, and it's just an example of what that paper looks like. So it was called The Camera. And uh, so he died at 30 years old, very young, and very much of a surprise. So Lola moved back down here, and her, step her stepfather, Oscar Warling, built the laundry for her. As I mentioned earlier, he would do anything for anyone. So she and her son, Oren Robbins, Elmer's son, uh, who she called Bobby, they lived at the, at, the, at the laundry right there, and that's what it looked like. So her stepfather, Oscar, built that for her. And that's her standing out in front. She had lost her husband, of course, by then. That didn't even, that's new enough, believe it or not, even though it looks dirty, that it didn't even have its paint on yet. It hadn't even been painted. So that's pretty, um, pretty original uh, in the building of, of it. What year? Uh, that was uh, uh, that would be 1898. I believe, I believe. Um, but I, I dropped my book, so I'm trying to. I have I have that information down. Um, so he built it, and my mother, my sweet mother, she remembers going to that laundry quite a bit. So she drew out what that laundry looked like inside. Now you can't see all that detail, but. I can share with you that I'm going to have to find what I dropped. She, uh, she and Oren, her two-year-old son, lived on the side in a tent, and it had dirt floors. They slept there, but then the kitchen was inside, and I don't know if you can see right down the middle strip, it says living room, kitchen. So they, they functioned inside that area, but they slept out in the tent in order to save as much uh, space for that laundry. Um, no, good, I have my notes. Okay. No, that was 1924. 1924. I knew it couldn't have been that far back. Um, so it was called the Laguna Beach Laundry. And I just two weeks ago traveled up to Grass Valley where Lola's son, Oren's wife, Teresa, lives at 96 years old. And I visited Teresa and her son. Their daughter, Gail Robbins, has recently passed away, which was sad because I, I got a, some really nice communications and met her and had fun with her. She's a second cousin twice removed to me. But uh, Teresa shared with me just a few tidbits about that time period. Her mother-in-law was Lola. Her husband was the direct son of Lola. That's where that comes in. But she said that during that time, they would go catch grunion down at the beach. They would get mussels off of the pier. They would fry them even in her area, her laundry area. And... Uh, Victor Mature was, came into the laundry, and he was just going to be married soon. And then Betty Davis, she said, this is what Teresa said, she would sit out on her little ledge and smoke her cigarettes while her husband went into the water and, and had fun and surfed the water. And she said her husband's feet were so big that he had to wear, and I don't understand this, tennis shoes when he went in the water. But that's what Teresa said. And I asked Teresa if she would come down here and visit, and at 96 years old, she chose not to. <laughs> so, uh, but she's a dear lady and bright as can be. And uh, so that is the information that she has on that house. And there's a big boiler there. 
they, and they tore that house down uh, and built a cottage for uh, Teresa and her husband, Oren. And that was in 1948. So that's, Teresa did say that that was torn down in 1948 and instead was built a small cottage for she and her husband, Oren, Bobby Robbins, to live in. And what year that was then torn down to build the actual mall itself, I don't know that. So going on from there, another piece of property that was in our family is the Warling House. And Barbara Diamond is here tonight, which I'm so thrilled to see her because she lives in the Warling House on Diamond Street. Is that amazing? And uh, the Warling House was at the corner of Forest Avenue and PCH. So Aura bought that property too. Remember, her sister was my great-grandmother. So she bought that property from her, her uncle George and uh, as others did also. And the, the, the city, or let's see, I'm getting ahead of myself. I don't want to do that. The city, and here's another angle of it, another picture of it, and I have a painting in my house that is of the Warling House also, and I don't know who painted it. Uh, I asked if Jane and I, and we searched that, but we couldn't find who painted it. But they wanted to widen Coast Highway. So they told the Warlings, okay, we will move your house for you. And they did. They did move their house over to Diamond and Glen Airy. So, and, and so that's where that ended up there. They moved, the Warlings moved to then where that house was transferred, and they stayed there the rest of their lives, basically. They lived out their lives there. And then the generations of the Rogers, just to share with you, this is a picture of Aura and Lola, her daughter, and then Jenny Wayman Bruno Johnson, my gram great grandmother, and then her sister Mary Johnson Stromerson Oftenkamp. And you've heard of those names, I bet. Some of you have heard of those names. Oftenkamp, Fred Oftenkamp was her husband, and he started the uh, theater right here. And uh, so every offshoot of this early family has has stories, and I have stories, but I just. I can't do it all at one time. He's also the father of the Waters. Sister. Yes. The modern yes. Yes. See, you could share a lot too, couldn't you? Yes. Yes. I knew Robin. You did. I'm 97 years old. I knew Oh. Wow. And. Uh, he knew you are 97, and you knew Oren Robbins, which is Lola's son. At two years old, they moved, she moved there in that, do you remember that laundry? Yes. My goodness. What is your name? Art Sherman. Art Sherman, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Where was that? Here in Laguna? Yeah. All right. Wow. That's great. Oh, no. I love that. Oh, you, you better. You better. Now, my great-grandmother... Mary Dave Johnson, she met him back in Illinois. They married back there, and he came out here, and he, he was the first chief of police for Laguna, Abe Johnson Jr., I mean, Sr., I'm sorry. Now, Jenny had Lenore, my, my grandmother, first, by her first husband, Ed, Ed Bruno. He was French. But after Abe Johnson Sr. and my grandmother married, my great-grandmother married. They had three more children. So you will hear Abe Johnson, but that's Abe Johnson Jr. And Mary, my, my aunt, Mary Stromerson Oftenkamp, that's my grandmother's stepsister. So it gets a little convoluted, but we're okay with that, right? We're okay with that. 
So that's Abe Johnson Sr. And this is my, my great grandmother with her sister Aura. And this is kind of a visible picture that people might see. Some of these pictures are, are often so, so uh, uh, what am I, available to so many of you and us that none of these are, are, are specifically new and fresh pictures. But this is my mother's writing that they were driving down uh, uh, in the canyon going to serve uh, the people inland. And they, they were both charter members of the Women's Club, Aura and Jenny, both sisters. And uh, Jenny was a charter member of Laguna Beach Presbyterian Church right here, which was right across from the laundry at that time. It was, it was right there. Uh, so I was going to talk about the first jail, which I could, with Abe Johnson moving it on skids also, and the first pier, and uh, the Sawdust Festival. Before the Sawdust Festival, it was a, a horse area that the Johnsons worked on, Kendall Johnson, all that line from... So there's a lot more, but I think, I think that's kind of enough. And um, this is um, my mother a few years ago, and this is four generations, my daughter and her new baby girl, my only granddaughter. She's now three. But my mother was in the beginning stages of Alzheimer's, but when she held that baby, she came alive. There's something about that. But I, I want to read this to you because I think that any, any sharing I give at any time, I want a deeper message out of that. I want a deeper message here. This is all information, and I love it. And it's all information. But what is the message that we can take away from this, that we all have a legacy? And are we building and working on that legacy for our downline? So I found this, and I have to read it. I saw behind me those who had gone, and before me those who are to come. I looked back and saw my father and mother, his father and mother. I saw behind me those who had gone and before me those who are to come. I looked back and saw my father and mother, his father and mother, and all their fathers and mothers. And in front, I see my son and daughter and his and her sons and daughter and the sons and daughters upon sons and daughters beyond. And their eyes were all my eyes. You know, isn't that the truth? You look into those generations and you see something carried forward. So only to say that uh, start just living your legacy, girls and boys, because that's what we're here for. And um, when we leave, if we write something, it'll last. If we do something enough to be written about, it will last. So that's, that's what I wanted to share. But thank you very much. Thank you, Carol. We'll have some time for some questions and comments, but we, we ha you have to use the microphone or the people at home don't know what's going on. <laughs> so, Testing. Joanna will bring the microphone around to those of you who would like Carol to speak. Or anybody else? I love just hear sharing like Art shared. If you have, I don't have the answers to every question. <laughs> I'll try, but does anybody have now you, you and the, the, you came up with an interesting tidbit there that not everybody knew about. No? Okay. I have a question. Yes. Third Street? It wasn't a street No. back then. No. So do you think they just slid it down the hill? It was a hill. Yeah. It was a hill. Yeah. Oh, no, nothing was a street back then. Huh? Nothing was a street no, back then. No, it wasn't a street. In 1888, okay. not very many streets. <laughs> no. Uh, until Henry plowed, I mean, he scraped streets. That was the first start right. of streets. Right, but he didn't scrape third. <laughs> No, he didn't. I don't no. know if I think that that house coming down there could have scraped it a little bit. <laughs> but no, he uh, he didn't. And, uh, it's because as little kids, we would sit up at the top yes. during art class and paint our pictures. So that's my memory. It was oh. a hill. And then another, uh, just a, a remark or asking you, Abe Johnson Sr. in his police uniform, being our first chief of police, and my father was the first motorcycle police yes, officer. He was. Yes. So what were the years for Abe Johnson? You know, I don't know for sure. I wouldn't want to give a year without really knowing it. Um, okay. uh, let's well, my, see. Well, when, when was you? My dad was 1931 to 1937. Okay, I'll say that then. 
<laughs> well, no, I, I'd say maybe I think a little Gabe was earlier than that. But I know my mother, and that was her step-grandfather, but he knew her from <coughs> way back. Mm -hmm. But he, and she adored him. Mm -hmm. But he would uh, always be scouting down at Main Beach, and as soon as that Laguna, at the hotel, as soon as that light came on, they were signaling him to get back to the office. So he would watch that light. Hooray. And then he would say to my mother, he would always give her a nickel, and she would be so excited to get that nickel to go buy an ice cream cone. <laughs> but my mother always said that he would take her to the pavilion down in Main Beach, the dance pavilion, and he held her up, and she said, Carol, he held me up, and he said, now you look at those people in there. And of course, you couldn't hear the music. But you saw these people dancing with no music, and he goes, don't they look funny doing that? And my mom remembers so many cute little stories like that. Well, my uh, Chief Sprainy asked my father when he was 90 years old, <laughs> how, how did you know when to go somewhere? Yeah. And he said, well, you just waited for the neon light to turn on on top of Hotel Laguna. I mean, he says it so nonchalant. <laughs> <laughs> so fun, fun stories. Thank you, Carol. You're welcome. Any other questions? You want to say, oh, do you have a question? Another, another Carol. One, uh, one thing I wanted to mention, my father used to write history for the Post and for the Coastline, and he wrote a story about the red light on top of Hotel Laguna and Abe Johnson. And that whole thing, and I think it was Dorothy Bradley that was the telephone operator, uh -huh. who was Wendy Brown's mother, yeah. and Joyce Clark's mother. And uh, yeah, there's some really interesting things. Oh, it's such a great. So imagery. I do have a copy of that. Do you? I love Oh uh, yeah, that. sure. Okay. We we can't hear you. Oh, we're gonna get you on microphone, Barbara. <laughs> oh no, we want to hear you. No, it's not. Uh, the last time they were working downtown, uh, the planning commission tried to get the light back on. Oh. <laughs> Didn't fly too well. Uh, uh, you know, Barbara, you're writing so much now for for Stew News. So Barbara's a very uh, predominant writer in our community. She's been around. And she's a great writer, so make sure you see her name when you read things. You're going to see her name in the byline when you watch. Do we have any other questions? We didn't get questions. Art Sherman on um, microphone earlier. Do you have anything that you'd like to say to us that we can get recorded? <laughs> well, one thing, <laughs> we're lucky to be in this building. When I was <clears throat> young, the, this whole mountain was on fire and burned right down to the backyard here along the, it's a wonder the whole whole town didn't wow. burn down. Huh. And, uh, but I remember that very vividly. And of course I remember some of the, all these old names of uh -huh. Abe and so forth. Uh, I think one of, the, one of the police chiefs lives next door to me as a matter of fact. And I lived uh, on, uh, let's see, it was, see my mind's going. <laughs> anyway, we're at the top of the hill from the Hotel Laguna at Legion Street. Oh. I lived at the gas station there. Now they tore down our home and they <clears throat> put a gas station up instead. And I remember the old pier and there's a boy fishing off the old pier. And, uh, well, I'm, a lot of memories. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say that <clears throat> probably about 10 years ago, I did an oral history with Art. I don't know whether you remember my interviewing you, Art, but the transcript, so far as I know, is at the public library. Yeah. Anyone else? Then let's show our appreciation to Carol Lloyd for her presentation. Thank you. I, 
I would like to remind you that the Murphy Smith bungalow, if you haven't been there recently, has had a lot of changes, both in displays and in the inside of the building and some work being done now. So please come back. Uh, people are always thrilled when they come. It's open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 1 to 4 p.m. If the volunteer shows up, we hope they do. <laughs> and we thank you very much for coming tonight. And we hope you'll be members of the Historical Society. Thank you. If you're interested in the purchase of the map, come on up. And, um, and it's going to just two great causes. Hi.